Okay, let's start again. And let's continue directly where we have stopped. So we had the SU2 affine characters, this chi L's there in terms of ratios of theta functions. And hopefully, while well, I didn't prove this formula or anything, I didn't I convinced you somewhat that this is at least reasonable. Um, and now we wanted to look for modular transformations. So we wrote down the characters, so now we have to look how they transform under modular transformations. And uh, I take the cheap way out and compute the T matrix, which is almost trivial, and let you do the hard part, namely the S matrix in the exercises. But it's very explicitly. I guide you through it. Good. Sorry, we just don't have time. Um, so the, the T matrix, what was it? It's the transformation behavior of that character, which is still written up there, under T, tau goes to tau plus 1. Okay, so if tau goes to tau plus 1, that's the same thing as q to q times e to the 2 pi i. And so I just pick up e to the 2 pi i times the conformal weights in the representation minus c over 24. The conformal weights all differ by integers, so it doesn't matter which one I pick. So it's just e to the 2 pi i. And then the conformal weights in terms of in SU2s are this was the conformal weight of the highest weight representation, of the highest weight state, sorry, and then minus c over 24, which was explicitly k over 8k plus 2, 3k over 24. <laughs> Good, and since we're going back to the same representation, there's also delta there. Good. Thank you. Um, good, so that's relatively easy. <laughs> um, so S modular transformation is harder, and you should really do it. I encourage you to do the exercise. It's not too hard, but it's just a bit lengthy. What you get out of it is the following formula. So you get a nice sign. 2L plus 1, 2L prime plus 1 over k plus 2. Okay, So it's a finite dimensional matrix, takes arguments L, which again, so L runs from 0 to k over 2 in half integer steps. That's a finite dimensional matrix. This tells you how the characters transform into each other. Good. And uh, just some properties, so which Sylvain mentioned. So S is a symmetric matrix. That's obvious if you interchange L and L prime is symmetric. It's also, which is also part of the exercise, it's unitary. So S dagger S is one, the identity I mean. That. Okay, that's less obvious, but it's also true. And here the S matrix is also real, so that's a bit easier. Good, so this is our S matrix of the theory, and now I will use it. Good. Let's do 3.8, which is fusion rules. And if you remember, Silva introduced fusion rules by computing four-point functions. Then he computed the four-point functions with some degenerate representation and computed in the conformal block what is the field which can propagate in the, in the intermediate channel. Okay, so I will take a different route because I'm not so brave and compute four-point functions in best written models, which can be done, but it's hard. But instead, I will take the chicken way out and uh, use the Valinde formula. And the Valinde formula is some amazing tool you have in CFT, which tells you the fusion rules once you know the S matrix. So that's a general thing. It's not specific to Westermine Winden theories, but the Valinde formula, just if you know, okay, so technically I want a rational conformal feed theory, so everything is finite. So given the S matrix, the modular S matrix, so S matrix has nothing to do with scattering, just um, S matrix, I know the fusion rules. And again, the fusion rules told me what possible OPEs are allowed between different representations. 
So now I put two different primary fields of two different representations, compute their OP and ask what possible representation can appear in their product. So it's sort of like a tensor product, but not for the finite dimensional algebra, but for the affine algebra. If you want, it's the klebsch gordon coefficients of the affine algebra. Good, so I write a fusion product like this. Um, so I fuse two representations, which I called m lambda and m mu. And the outcome of this is that I get some new representations, which are in the set of my allowed representations. I'm new, and I can get them with some multiplicity, which means that I can choose my OPE coefficients between those. Uh, if their multiplicity is bigger than one, I can choose some OPE coefficients independently. So that's my fusion product. Okay, so now the Verlinde formula is a magic tool. I won't uh, explain you why it's true, but... Okay, so this is some way of computing these fusion coefficients, these numbers. How many times does which module appear on the right-hand side? You can express entirely in terms of this S matrix. So and the formula is the following. So you sum over a third label, auxiliary label, sigma, and then you put three S matrices, S lambda sigma, S mu sigma, and S nu sigma of the three arguments. Generally, you have to complex, conjugate the third one because it's upstairs index, and then divide out by S zero sigma, where by zero I mean the vacuum representation. So zero and R is the vacuum representation. Which is a representation you always have. So that's the representation where also the zero modes act trivially. So in our context, it's the spin zero representation. Okay, so that's a magic formula, and it's always true. You can use it. Yes? Uh, it's really, I, I actually don't know the proof, but it's, I mean, you can look at the proof uh, in the yellow book if you want, but it's quite complicated. <laughs> yes? Yeah, this, this is very non-trivial also. So you can already use this constraint that this is an integer. That's right. So these S's are usually not integers because they're signs or some complicated thing, but here's always an integer. So it's not very credible that this is an integer. You can even use it as a constraint on your S matrix to constrain your S matrix. Yeah. Okay. So that's just another way of obtaining the fusion products without these crazy hypergeometric functions. Okay, so uh, also as an exercise, uh, you should evaluate this for SU2. So it's straightforward. You just plug this in here and compute the sum. It's a bunch of geometric sums. You simplify, you get your fusion rules. And it goes like this. So you have L, the resulting L, goes from L1 minus L2, and then it goes up to L1 plus L2. Whereas usual SU2 representations, I want that the sum of the three is integer. So it runs off sort of every second once. It's like SU2 representation. Except that this is not true. And now comes something you might recognize. There's actually a minimum up here. And if this gets too large, we might run out of the allowed representations. Because for instance, you could start with L1 equal to K over two, L2 equal to K over two, and then this would be K, and that's not allowed. So once you go over the bound, you turn around, and this is k minus L1 minus L2. Okay, this is exactly the same structure as appeared in the minimum models, which is also not a coincidence, but I don't have time to explain. Um, good, so this is the, these are the fusion rules of affine, of the SU2 affine, Katsumudi algebra. And you can compute it for any algebra you like, the closed formulas for any algebra. <clears throat> so just again to, so global SU2 would give you this. <clears throat> and in the, in the spirit of silver, that's what you would generically maybe expect. But now you have this additional null vector at level k plus one minus two L, which restricts your fusion further. So you have an additional constraint which restricts your fusion to that. So if you, I don't have integer k or something, that's what uh, I should expect generically. 
Okay. And um, yeah, so you can play around with this a little bit. In particular, there's the interesting property that the fusion of k half, the maximal one, with any l just folds it to k half minus l. So it just folds it around. Such a thing, if it exists, it's called simple current of a CFT. That's one example of a simple current. So the definition of simple current is it is a module of a CFT. If you fuse it with any other module, the result will only give you one module, not more modules. Okay. And the simple current is not a current, I should say. It's not a conformal weight one field necessarily, but it's still called simple current, which is confusing. Okay. <laughs> Good. So are there any questions to this? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, so the question is whether it's a current in the sense of Noether theorem, and the answer is no, it's not a current in the sense of Noether theorem. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Then uh, let's talk about modular invariance. So basically now I want to put my theory completely on the torus. I already put my representations on the th torus. Now we consider the complete theory. And we try to see what theories are consistent on the torus. So this will give me some constraints on what representations I can put in. So I just postulated that my Hilbert space of the full theory looks like this. So I sum over lambda mu in my represent allowed representations. I have some matrix which tells me how many times these representations will appear. And then I take the left moving so curly M. So I have many M's, it's also not much better. Um, and the right moving representation. So now I've put finally the right movers in. So till now it was only left movers all the time. So this is, should be the Hilbert space of my full CFT. Okay? So I also consider non diagonal ones. So Sylvain discussed uh, always where this m is just the delta mu nu, like that. OK, but uh, we, we can do a bit more. OK, so um, now we can put uh, many consistency conditions on this. So for instance, the one Sylvain cons uh, considered was that this set I write down should close under fusion. That is one possible consistency condition. Or you can do, OK, you can look at crossing symmetry and see what, what is the possible spectrum of the theory. Um, OK, I'm not so bra brave because, again, I don't want to compute four-point functions or one-point functions on the torus. But I will just be lazy and compute zero-point functions on the torus, where I also get a constraint. And the constraint is that the partition function of the theory, so which now depends on tau and tau bar. I can forget about, about the z or put it, whatever you like, the chemical potential. And the partition function is just, uh, let's recall it was the trace over now the whole Hilbert space. And now I put L and L bar here. Okay, that was the definition. And I can express it in terms of my characters. So my lambda mu's, some multiplicities, the character of tau, and the character of mu of minus tau bar. Okay. Good. And so what I want is that this is modular invariant. So it should be invariant on the modular transformation, not just modular covariant like the characters were. Good. Uh, so let's write down three requirements I want. Uh, so the first two are stupid. The third is modular invariant. I call integrality, which is a stupid requirement that everything should be every representation should appear an integer number of times and non-negative integer. And second one is, uh, if you want uniqueness of vacuum, which is that the M00, remember I denoted zero in R as my vacuum, should be one. So I want once the vacuum, not twice and not zero times, just once. And the third one is model invariance. OK, and um, let's change blackboards. 
So what does model invariance mean here? So it's something we can entirely express in terms of our M's and S's and T's also, if you want. So if we apply modular transformations on this partition function Z there, what we will get is two S's if we do the S modular transformations. And uh, so the form is uh, I get, yeah, I, mean, I get S dagger M S in matrix notation. So the S because the M, yeah, maybe I do more details. So the, the Z minus one over tau minus one over tau bar will be what? So it is just M, so sum of lambda mu, M lambda mu. And then I have to sum, I have to use the definition of my S matrix. So this is essentially the computation you saw this morning. And I have a lambda prime and a mu prime in R. And then I get S lambda lambda prime, chi lambda prime of tau. And similarly for the right movers, I get S mu mu prime, chi mu prime minus tau bar. But I, another way of writing minus tau bar is just complex conjugating the whole character. That's why the S should also be complex conjugated. So, but it doesn't matter in this context because the S is actually real. But just in general, there would be a complex conjugate there. But you can, on the other hand, this should just be Z again, okay? This should be just the original thing. So if you look what happens on the uh, matrix level, so I can write this as sum of lambda prime mu primes R. So here I have just the matrix multiplication of S transposed with M with, um, right, with M with S star. Of the whole thing, I'm taking the in the, uh, the component lambda prime mu prime. And here this just is the same thing. Okay, and this should be the original thing. So this tells you that S transposed M S star is M. That's the constraint of modular invariance. And uh, another nice way of writing this is because we already saw that S transposed is S and S dagger S is one. It was unitary and symmetric. So you can rewrite this as by just taking it on the other side by that the commutator of M with S is zero. So they just commute because that's the same thing as S, M, S to the minus one. Good, and similarly I want the same thing with T which is a bit more stupid but I want also that M commutes with T, okay? So that's one statement of putting model invariants. So now you can ask, okay, what are possible solutions for this matrix M, which satisfies these three requirements, okay? It turns out there are not much, not many solutions. Okay, there is one stupid solution again, if you want, uh, which is the diagonal modular invariant. So the diagonal modular invariant gives you, sets M to be the identity, or M lambda mu is delta lambda mu. First, um, everything is integral because it's zero or one. So A is check, B, the vacuum appears once because M zero zero is delta zero zero is one. And third, it's trivially because it's the, the, the identity matrix, it commutes with S and T. So it's really trivial that this is a model invariant. Okay, so this always exists for any theory. You can always write this. Good, but actually for SU2 level K, something way cooler is true. And for SU2 level K, there's a classification of all the possible matrices M which commute, uh, which satisfy these three requirements. So this is sometimes called the ADE classification. Okay, so there are three types, namely A, D, and E. 
And the A type is just the diagonal mod invariant. So that's just this one. And it exists, uh, so once we go on, you will see that some of them only exist for particular levels, k. So this one exists for any level. So you can take this exists for any k and z bigger or equal than 1. You can always do. OK. Let's do something more interesting. Let's do the d type. The d type is not diagonal. And uh, for it to exist, k has to be even. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. And there's still two subcases. So k can be a multiple of 4, or k cannot be a multiple of 4. And maybe let me write it down. Um, so I write like, sorry, that's a small n. So I have actually multiplicity here. And then I have more stuff. So that's my complete Hilbert space. And L goes from 0 to n minus 1. And it goes only over integers in this case. And here you have ML plus M2N minus L and times the same thing for the right moves. OK, so in particular, you notice that there are also now things combined which are not the same left and right. So you have here ML with M2N mi minus L. So it's not the same left and right. So that's an example of a non-diagonal mod invariant. OK, maybe I should also. Uh, OK, maybe I put bars, yes. Sorry, there's, no bar. <laughs> there's a bar in there. Yeah, maybe that's good. And good. So the second subcase, maybe I can also, um, yeah, I don't know whether it's interesting, but it takes a slightly different form. So it's of this form. The E's for sure I will not write down because they're lengthy. Um, like this, and it still goes on. And minus 3 half now. Now it runs over every half integer, so or every non-integer. And I have ML with M2N minus 1 minus L bar plus M2N minus 1 minus L with M2L bar. OK, so it looks slightly complicated. Um, but the main, so still it's not diagonal. The main reason why it's different is that this mn uh, now is not, I mean, it's not integer, but half integer. And so it has different, it's not a real, but a pseudo real representation. But, so that's why there are two subcases. OK, so we will come in a second uh, to what is this crazy thing. And then, um, Finally, we have E-type modular invariant. And this only exists for three different levels. So, so there are three ones. So the first one appears at k equal to 10. I will call E6. The next one at k equal to 18, which is E7. And the last one at k equal to 28, which is E8. So some people call them also AK here and DK. So now you may also know, notice that ADE makes some sense because they exactly follow the pattern of ADE, the algebras. But the connection is not so obvious what it should be. But basically, you see in the algebras, you should classify positive integer matrices. These are the Cartan matrices and also here. So that's why there is a connection. But it's not obvious from what I said. OK, and I put them in the lecture notes how they look like, but it's complicated. OK, um, so that's the classification for SU2. Are there any questions to this? Good. Uh, so the question is whether SU2 level K is the only algebra where, where there is a classification. The answer is no, but uh, it's not much better. So we 
So SU3 level K is classified. I believe SU2 level K times SU2 level K prime is classified. Uh, I'm not sure, so those I'm sure, but for sure there's no general classification. Yeah, so that's an important open problem. If you want to contribute, you can try. Um, good, so now we should clean a blackboard. And good, so the final thing I want to do, I have 20 minutes left, is to understand why there are some non-diagonal model invariants and what do they mean. Because you might think, okay, we started with the SU2 Westerminowitten model, so now, why now we have three different models and some only appear at some level and so on? So what, what, what's the reason? Okay. So let's do that. And uh, let's try to, let's look at the simplest non-diagonal model invariant we have, which is the D-type model invariant at k equal to 4. So if you look, there's actually also one at k equal to 2, but it happens to be accidentally equal to the A-type model invariant which is like in the algebras, where also the small d's are, the d2 is the a2. Good, so let's look at this k equal to 4 d-type. And let's just write again. So it's m0 plus m2 tensor m0 bar plus m2. And then we have 2 times m1. It's just a formula for that. So we have, first of all, only integer spin representations, no half integer spin representations. And second, you see that something interesting happens because actually the vacuum representation gets combined with some other representation, which is this M2. So somehow we have a bigger vacuum module. So what's going on? Let's, to, to understand, let's compute the conformal weight of that additional representation we put in. So by that, I mean the conformal weight of the highest weight state, which is L equal to 2. Okay, let's use one of our favorite formulas. We should put the Casimir over K plus 2. K is 4 plus 2. It's very simple. That's 1. Okay, so I have somehow magically more conformal weight 1 fields. And they're holomorphic because the right moving, I'm still in the vacuum. I can pick the right moving vacuum and here the, the highest weight state and it's a holomorphic spin one field. So what I do, did I told you in, to you in the very beginning? If you have a holomorphic spin one field, it's a conserved current. So somehow magically, this theory sh seems to have more conserved currents. And how many more does it have? So the spin two representation is five dimensional. So in total, we had the three we started with because we had SU2 symmetry. So now we have eight, which is three plus five, conserved currents. Okay. Good. And they form some algebra. What algebra can they basically possibly form? So what is an eight-dimensional algebra? The only one is SU3. I mean, you can ex explicitly check, but they will form an SU3 symmetry. Okay. So there's an ex accidental ex enhancement. I'm not saying that uh, the D-type model invariant will always have SU3 symmetry. Okay, um, good. So here there's an SU3 symmetry. So we might suspect that this is secretly an SU3 Westerminowitten model because you, we have SU3 currents now. Okay, so um, let's make the bold claim that this SU2 level 4 Westerminowitten model is actually SU3 at level some, some level. Some K. Okay, um, so can this be true? So it seems to be true because this has SU3 symmetry algebra. So here maybe I should write D type. Okay, not, not the A type, SU2 level 4. Good. So now, what uh, if this, is, this should be true because they have the same symmetry algebra? Except I didn't told you what the level of this SU3 symmetry should be. And to determine the level, there are different methods. Either you can directly do it algebraically here, think of how this embeds, compute it, 
Another nice method is just to compute the central charge of both theories. And uh, the central charge of SU2 level 4, let's do another nice computation, is 4 times the dimension of SU2, which is 3, over 4 plus the dual Coxeter number, which is 2. So that turns out to be 2. Okay? And on the other hand, the central charge of SU3 level k is equal to k times the dimension, which is now 8, over k plus 3, because now the dual Coxeter number is 3. And this we want to be equal to 2. So what is the k? k equal to 1 does the job, right? Because then it's 8 over 4, and no other k. So k is equal to 1. So that's good, it turned out to be integer. Otherwise, we're in trouble. So now we know what this k is. It's actually 1. So this tells you that the SU2 level 4 D-type mod Vesuvian model is just SU3 level 1 in disguise. OK. But if this is true, we should also see it on the complete Hilbert space. Now we just looked at the vacuum representation. So let's try to do it for the complete Hilbert space. So now I just tell you what the possible modules of SU3 level 1 are. So I told you there's a generalization of this L smaller or equal than k over 2 for any Lie algebra. And here is level 1. So there are only very few possible modules. The ones which are possible are the vacuum module of SU3. I will, to distinguish from M0 of SU2, I will write a 1, which means the one-dimensional representation of SU3. They're underlined because it's like a fat. I can have the 3, which is the fundamental representation, and I can have the 3 bar, which is the anti-fundamental representation of SU3. These are the three possible ground state representations of the SU3 level 1 best bottom model. Okay? So this is, you can show by similar analysis. So if this is true, I should be able to recast my Hilbert space in, in, in SU3 level 1 language. So let's do it. So this tells you that H. So here we saw already we have SU3 symmetry. So this should be the vacuum module of our new extended theory. So it's a vacuum module. Like that, left and right. And now, fortunately, I have two times this M1. M1 is a three-dimensional representation, the ground set representation. Here, I have also three-dimensional representations. And, okay, so I can put either like this. Okay, that's a possibility. That's the diagonal modular invariant with respect to SU3. But it becomes even more funny because there's an additional there's also a different way of seeing it as an SU3 model, which goes like this. So I should put bars, I'm sorry. Uh, so I combine the 3 with the 3 bar. And I combine the 3 bar with the 3. That's also a model invariant. And that's a model invariant which also always exists. Uh, this is called the charge conjugation modular invariant because the 3 on the charge conjugation becomes a 3 bar. Just think in terms of quarks, co charge conjugation becomes anti quarks. So the 3 becomes a 3 bar, so I can pair them up. So this corresponds to the solution that M lambda mu is C lambda mu, which is the charge conjugation matrix, which you can always write as S squared lambda mu. Sometimes S squared is the identity, sometimes not, in which case is this C. Okay, in SU2, there was no such thing because S, was, S squared already was the identity. And indeed, all SU2 representations are self-conjugate. Okay, so I have two different ways of interpreting this as an SU3 model invariant. Okay, is this clear? So now we understood that actually one Vestiminoid model is secretly another. So let me formalize this a little bit. Uh, which is, sorry, uh, the concept of conform embedding. The conform embedding is if I, ha I start with some affine D algebra G at some level, which for me was the SU3 level 1, and I embed some other sub-affine Katz-Moody-Lee algebra in it, 
at possible different levels. So in our example, this was SU2 level 4, which is a subalgebra of SU3 level 1. Okay? So, and such an embedding, okay, that's not very special to have it. You could also embed um, a lot of algebras into SU3 level 1, or so SU2 level 1 or something. But something special happens if the energy momentum tensors of the two theories agree. So I don't only embed the algebras, but the Sugawara tensor of this becomes the Sugawara tensor of this. And a necessary and sufficient criterion for this to happen, at least if they're integers, um, is if just the central charges agree. Then I call this a conformal embedding. If you have a conformal embedding of some algebra into another algebra, then you can always recast the model in terms of the bigger algebra. You should always use it. If you have more symmetry, you should use it. Good, and this was one example of conformal embedding. Um, okay. Good. We, we actually have seen also another example, maybe I can also mention. So we have seen that S U N level 1, where N complex free fermions. But we have also seen that N, co I mean, N complex free fermions are somehow also 2N real free fermions. Okay, and then I told you 2N free, real free fermions are have SO2N level 1. Okay, so this tells you that, why, why, what, what are now the equal signs here all? So this tells you that the UN level 1 embeds conformally into SO2N level 1. So the statement is that there is a conformal embedding there. Good, and in the exercises you will see two other conformal embeddings. So you can explain the, the E-type, some of the E-type uh, model invariants, they're secretly different algebras. So the E6 modular invariant is SU5, SO5 level 1, and the E8 modular invariant is G2 level 1 of the G2 Lie algebra. Okay, um, but let me, good, so maybe one last thing. We have seen that the D-type modular invariant always exists, at least if the level is even. And this might resonate with some question I had four lectures ago in the audience, uh, that if my Lie group I started with in the action was not simply connected, like SO3, then I had a slightly weaker constraint on my quantization of K, or stronger con constraint. And what we saw, or I told you, that if you start with a SO3 Lie group, then K was forced to be an even integer. Okay, and that's from this topological argument. And it's in fact true, and, but the symmetry is exactly the same. If you go to the Lie algebra, you will be blind to this difference. So what is actually true is that the deep type model invariant, in general, is the SO3 uh, Westerminovit model. It's SO3 level, okay, maybe I call this then K over two. Westerminovitten model. So I can, uh, so now you see that why I could, in principle, restrict from the get go to simply connected groups, because on the level of the algebra I don't care, and how the non simply connectedness comes back to me is in form of some other model invariant. So this generalizes for SUN, you can take different quotients by some centers, and those correspond to different model invariants you can get. Okay, so I think I, I'm done with the material I wanted to cover. So there's one additional chapter in the lecture notes about cosets, which are gauged Westerminoit models. So you gauge some subgroup out. But unfortunately, I don't have time to discuss, but you're very welcome to read. It's just four pages or something. Um, good. So maybe let's, let's thank Lawrence for this fantastic lecture. <laughs> He's also the youngest uh, speaker in this school, so then we have to give him a second hand uh, for just finishing his PhD now and being able to do this. <laughs> and maybe questions. So, can you... Yes. So, how you identify the vacuum model of the SU3? Because the vacuum 
Yes, I mean left moving and right moving independent. So the question is how, how to match the M0 plus M2 with the vacuum module of SU3 level one. And of course, I mean, I, I told you that there's this conform embedding and we have seen that there is a conform embedding because you have more symmetry suddenly at your disposal in some algebra, it's, it's, it's this SU3 level one. Of course, this implies you a spectacular character identities if you want. So you can compute the vacuum character of SU3 level one now in terms of the sum of two SU2 characters, which is highly non-trivial. Um, yeah. Yes. So, are you on the level of the spectrum, the central charge that these theories imply? What about the open equivalence? Good. So, the question is uh, I have argued that those theories are the same by computing spectrum central charges. Uh, why are the OPE coefficients the same? The reason is basically the same as in uh, Sylvain's lectures. Once you have a rational conformal field series, you have just a finite spectrum, and your theory is so constrained that the bootstrap equations basically only admit one solution. So once you know your spectrum and your algebra, everything is determined. So that's not a proof, of course, but that's the general expectation. Yes, please. No, the, ah, yes, so you say, okay, the question is, okay, these central charges are actually integers, two, two. So it seems like these are just free theories, which is true because you can write this SU3 level one in terms of two free bosons at some, on some particular lattice, SU3 lattice. Uh, so in this case, it's true that these are just integers and free theories if you want. But not for all conformal embeddings is true. I mean, this still, okay, this would tell you that the SU2 level four also is free. So I think I have some other examples where it's not uh, free. Uh, yeah, for, so, so yeah, the ones you look at in the exercise, so the E type, the E8, embeds into G2 level one. That's still level one, but this is not simply laced. So the construction doesn't work, the free field construction. So here, both sides are non-free. Uh, non and there are many more. This is not the only one. Uh, 